Okay, so welcome everybody to our talk today. Uh, just before we get started with our speaker, I'll just give a bit of background to our presentation series here. So this presentation series is part of our UOW Data and Decision Science Initiative, which is part of our strategic plan here at UOW to uh, increase our capacity in data science. And I've put the website there, I'll put it in the chat later for our Data and Decision Science Initiative where you can find further details or you can contact me. My name's Professor Marika Batterham and I am the coordinator of the Data and Decision Science Initiative here. So just to quickly give you a bit of um, background on what we're doing, our initiative has four key areas of focus and what we're talking about today is underlined. That's our data and decision science network. So it's a virtual network of researchers who are interested in data science methods. They don't need to be actively using them, although it does welcome people who are active in the community, but also people who are just interested in data science methods as well. And we have a seminar series, which is what we're doing today, where we're talking about themes that people are interested in. And we have presenters who give talks to a broad audience about a particular topic. We also have a strong focus on education, both internally and externally, and on industry engagement. So we are recording this meeting today. So if you're concerned about that, you can switch your cameras off. Um, I will stop sharing now and I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Alberto Natel Aguirre to introduce our guest speaker today. Hi, uh, hello everybody. So uh, I'm very, 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 very glad to be introducing Ian, Ian Schreier, Dr. Schreier. Uh, I'll give you first the official uh, part, right, which I think it was part on the email, but you know, he has been practicing sport medicine for over 30 years and he's past president of the Canadian Academy of Sport Medicine. He has a PhD in physiology, postdoctoral training in epidemiology, and over 290 peer-reviewed publications on topics related to the effects of exercise and sport medicine injuries. Return to play uh, and return to play decision-making, injury epidemiology, causal inference, and meta-analysis. He was the co-editor-in-chief of Review Synthesis Methods and is an editorial board member of three international sport medicine journals. Still, this little uh, uh, paragraph doesn't tell you what I can tell you. My experience is that uh, talking to Ian, working with Ian, is uh, it's a definite joy. It's an intellectual challenge. It's never, ever boring. And uh, you always learn, and we always learn as a team. Uh, Ian is one of the clinician uh, epidemiologist people that asks a question actually wanting to hear your answer rather than wanting to, you know, confirm what he wanted you to say. And there's so much to learn from him. I could spend hours throwing accolades because uh, he's one of my favorite epidemiologists. Uh, but, you know, I should stop and, uh, and let Ian just go for it. Ian, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Alberto. Um, so those words were, um, they were very nice. Uh, they're not all true. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope to at least convey some ideas here. Um, I have, uh, in my presentations, I try to give a little bit to uh, a little bit of back, a, a little bit of basic stuff for those who don't know much, and then some intermediate and a little bit of advanced stuff. So I don't expect everybody to follow everything I'm saying. Um, but I hope at least it'll stimulate you to read more and learn more. Um, and I don't know your audience. I don't know the audience here. I asked Alberto about who would attend. And so you have some people who are into machine learning and some people who do some causal inference and some people who are just epidemiology. So I'm going to try and give a little bit of that. And um, part of uh, when Alberta said my PhD was in physiology, that might be why I'm so interested in causal inference, because in physiology, we're just only interested in causes. And so when I got bored of physiology, and then I went and did a postdoc in epi, I basically just took over every, I, I adapted everything from physiology and just always thought about causes. 
and was amazed when causal inference came around because all of a sudden this was like a new field, but for me it was just um, everything was the same. So a, a causal diagram, we're gonna come back to this in a bit, but causal diagram is just a way of identifying what you think are causes. So here, let's say that we have a, a coach's philosophy. Um, so this is AI versus causal inference. And, and coach, coach's philosophy will affect the fitness level of the players by the training programs that they give. And the coach also creates team motivation for different things and for exercises, and that can cause injury. And so the question is, if, if you had this type of data generating structure, if this were true, then and you wanted to know the effect of warm-up exercises on injury, what variables would you adjust for in the, in the statistical model? Or what variables would you throw into the soup if you were just gonna try machine learning and let it do its thing? Now, in this toy example I've given you, the coach's philosophy is measured, but team motivation and fitness level aren't. So you really only have, do you include coach's philosophy or not? Um, so if we, follow a traditional epidemiological approach, we would absolutely include coaches' philosophy. And the AI approach, machine learning approach, in general, follows traditional epidemiological approaches. And so it basically gives you the same answer in this case. Now here are the results. This comes from uh, our student Tyrell Stokes who's published in Stat Methods, this um, idea. And it's, a, it's somewhat taken from that paper. So here's, if we use artificial traditional approach, our true estimate is up here. This is like uh, 0.75. And in the traditional approach, we would include coach's philosophy and we would end up with an estimate that is actually on the opposite side of the null. So we're actually getting an estimate that's completely wrong. And if we used artificial intelligence with lasso or lasso one standard error, we also get the wrong answer. And if you use an advanced causal inference approach, so this is, we're not gonna get into how, this is really an advanced problem, but if you actually use the advanced techniques, you would still be on the wrong side of the no, but you'd be much closer. And I wanna highlight this is that when we're trying to determine causes, we cannot get it just from the data. We have the data and then we have to interpret it, which requires that we make other assumptions. And some of those assumptions to the extent that they're right or wrong will mean whether or not we get the right answer. And that is true for causal for AI as well, and we'll come to very important examples later. So in the first part of this talk, we're gonna talk about prediction versus causation. In the second part, I'll introduce you to DAGs. And, and then I wanna show you this software because when we walk through the DAGs, it can appear simple, but then when you try and work it, it becomes very complicated. And so there's a very easy to use tool. And I'd like to give you some exposure to this tool so that you can actually walk away and tomorrow start to uh, use this approach. John Wooden's a famous basketball coach from the US. And he said, if you don't have the time to do it right now, when will you have the time to do it over? And that's what I always hear from my colleagues. I'm going, no, we should do it this way. No, no, we have to get it out. We have to, we, we want to submit. And then we'll, we'll do it later. But nobody ever does it later. And if you get it wrong the first time and you're spreading that result and that conclusion and people are acting on it, you could actually be harming a lot of people. Most of what I'm going to talk about comes, uh, is summarized in at least one of these four books. Uh, Uta Pearl uh, for the causal inference in statistics and his book for the general public, the book of why, 
Um, Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins, this is Causal Inference. It's now called What If? And it's an online book for free. If you Google Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins, you'll see this What If book. And Causal Inference, uh, Guido Imbins, who just won the Memorial Prize for Economics uh, based on some of his work with Causal Inference, but it was really uh, Don Rubin who, who developed all of this in the 70s and 80s. So let's talk about prediction. I come from sport medicine, so I'm going to use sport examples. And some of you may have heard of VO2 max and your oxygen capacity. And so we can put you on a treadmill and we can run different protocols and we can measure your VO2 max. Or we could predict your VO2 max depending on how far we go with it. And so here's the Bruce protocol, specific formula. And for men, we have one formula. Uh, T is time. And so you would multiply it to 14.8 minus something times time minus something times time squared minus plus something times times cubed. And for women, it's slightly different formula. And so based on this formula, we get a predicted VO2 max. So that's a prediction. It's fine. Prediction, AI is really good at developing those formulas and at looking at pictures. So here, this is me. That's my lollipop, love and life companion, and our niece. And these three people happen to be my friends, but my computer had never seen them or I'd never named them. And so it doesn't know who they are. But it does recognize that these are faces. And so AI is amazing at image recognition, which is strictly a prediction question. Now, AI also makes some mistakes. Joel Pinot is one of the big shots at Facebook, also a prof at McGill University. Um, and so this is the answer that the AI gave when shown this sign. And it called it a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. Now, when you look at this, I don't see any food and drink. We don't know how the AI is ending up with its decision, but clearly this is close enough to some of the things that it's seen as refrigerators with food and drink to come to that conclusion. This one's a little bit more. It's a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. Well, it's definitely a yellow car. Is it a school bus? Most of it wouldn't say. Is it in a parking lot? Yeah, probably. So it's not as bad as the, as the refrigerator. So AI can do great things, but it's gotta be trained. And all it's doing is matching what it sees with what it's seen in the past. And causal inference is a very different type of problem. Let's go back to prediction. Some of you may have heard of FRAX, especially if you're physicians. And this is a tool that we use to calculate what your risk of fracture is. So if you're older and we're worried about osteoporosis, we're worried about osteoporosis thinning of the bones because that might, you might fall and break your bone. But that's not the only thing. We're, we're just interested more in the fracture than the osteoporosis itself. So here's the questionnaire, whether you had previous fractures and other questions. And I want to focus on this alcohol right here. And according to the FRAX tool, if I fill out that I drink three or more units a day of alcohol, then I have a risk of 4.4 of major osteoporosis and a hip fracture of 0.4. And if I don't drink three or more units per day, I have less of a risk. Major osteoporotic fracture, 3.7, and hip fracture, 0.3. So my risk is reduced if I drink less. When, if I am drinking less, when I fill out this form. That's prediction. Now, in 2011, I was helping a colleague at Stanford with a study on total bone mineral density, and we used a method called CART. Uh, to me, I was just using statistics. Now I found out that I was using machine learning. So CART is a little bit more of machine learning. I'm not going to get into the machine learning, but very simply, if I set my cut at 0.5, I would end up with this type of graph, which says that Given my, if I have a low bone mineral density, less than 110, 
I go down, actually, I always forget which way. I think I go right on this. Then race becomes the next important factor. But if I have a high bone mineral density, then impact becomes uh, the important factor. And if I use a different cutoff, I get off, I, I get a different um, schema. Now we still have impact in race, but now we have other factors. And here we could see impact comes in on the ra after race over here, race never comes in over here. So what we're doing in this prediction is just trying to group people so that they're homogeneous groups. That's all the card is trying to do. And it's saying that, you know, out of all of these people, these 34 people all have a particular bone mineral density based on these levels. And here I would have a different one. And so it's grouping you into those things in terms of what's the exposure and what's the outcome. So if I had this set of data, and let's say I even did it in New York, and I did a randomized trial, and even I have this causal inference data, even prediction requires a causal inference approach. So if I know the causal effects in New York, and now I go to San Francisco, and in San Francisco, I have a different proportion of the racial distributions are different, different number of blacks and whites, different number of people are young and old. And so whatever intervention I did in New York, where I had an average, total average effect in that randomized trial, I can't just transport that value to San Francisco because maybe blacks have, you know, the effect in blacks is different than whites. And so if my population in San Francisco is a different proportion of blacks, than it did in New York, then my average treatment effect in San Francisco is going to be different. And so I have to understand those causal relationships in actual fact, in order to figure out what that causal effect in New York would look like if I brought that same intervention over to San Francisco. And in the sport field, we do this all the time. We think about um, activities in hockey and tr maybe translate them to wheelchair basketball or training for a marathon versus training in a triathlon. Every time you change the population, slightly change the intervention, slightly change the comparison group or slightly change the outcome, you can use causal inference through uh, Baron Boehm's and, and uh, uh, Yuta Pearl's methods in order to take that causal effect that you had and determine if you can actually predict or calculate what the causal effect would be in this new population. Strictly a prediction question there, but you need to have a causal inference approach. So now I wanna come back to the FRAX. So in the FRAX tool, I told you that if the alcohol is, if I answered yes, I would have 4.4 and 0.4, but if I answered no, it would be 3.7 and 0.3. But that's a prediction question based on the observational data. And really what, I'm, what people do is they take this analysis, which could have been done through epidemiology or AI or however you want to do it. And they say, if I lowered my alcohol from more than 1.5, from more than three or more units per day to less than three or more units per day, that that would decrease my fracture risk. That is a causal question. And the analyses that were done to pull out these numbers were not causal analyses. They were predictive analyses. And so this is, if the world stays the same, then, every, then that would be true. But the fact is, when I say I am personally going to lower my consumption of alcohol, that is no longer the same world. I have now changed the world. That observational data was people just doing what they're doing. And that's a prediction. But now we want to say, what is going to happen when I change the world with this intervention? And that's a causal question. And that's where the AI won't work 
or it'll work as well as traditional epidemiology, which also has all of its problems. And we're going to come to how you can decide when it would work and when it wouldn't. The same thing is true for the bone mineral density. Here I showed you that race is important. But if I change my skin color, will my bone mineral density increase? Now, this comes to something a little bit more elaborate, which is what do we mean by race? Do we mean skin color or do we mean everything that comes together with race? Do we mean the genes? Do we mean the education? Do we mean the nutrition? Do we, the, because of you know, different poverty levels and all of those things. So again, a lot of causal inference is about being very precise in what your question is. And, and I learned that in physiology, by the way, when, when I was a student, we used to have these things called beer seminars on Wednesday, it was a, it was a good group. And uh, as a student, if you got past your first slide, it was a success. So you show your first slide and everybody would fire questions. What does that word mean? What is this? What is that question? No, that's not precise enough. And causal inference is about being precise in your question, which means population, intervention, comparison, outcome, covariates, all of those things. Here's another example where we could say age, different people of different ages play different sports. If you're strong, you're likely to play more sports than other sports. If you're strong, you're likely to have increased load. Um, you might have strong, you might, your body might be more resistant to injury from the same load. You might have flexibility and stretching that affects load. Previous injury could flex flexibility and strength. And if you threw all of these into a AI soup, you would end up with sport load and load tolerance as the important factors. And I can tell you when people run multiple regression and they do this, they end up, they would end up concluding that strength and flexibility are not important because they don't predict injury. But that's wrong. They don't predict injury after accounting for sport load and load tolerance. That doesn't mean that an intervention on strength or an intervention on flexibility will not affect injury. In fact, if this is true, this causal diagram, then increasing strength will prevent injury and changing flexibility will either prevent or cause injury. I didn't tell you whether strength causes or prevents injury, but in, in these, that changing these values will change your risk of injury, even though you run the analysis and it says that those things are unimportant. So I want to stop there for a second and just find out if there's any questions on that. Um, so I can't see... on the chat, but uh, but uh, well, let's hold for well. let's see if anybody has yeah. any questions on prediction versus uh, causation. Just on that part first. Feel free to unmute if you have a question or raise your hand, whichever. Good, okay. Well, let's hope that's clear. And let's can, go to- Can I just ask a little comment question? Yeah. You know, the first thing you said about, you know, the that uh, causal is still wrong, but it's closer, uh, as long as it's not closer to saying, I mean, what is worse to have a reverse effect or to have, uh, you know, that there is no effect, because at least it calls your attention to you need to check something. What would be your your take on that? Oh, well, so I, I'm, I'm in health. And if I tell somebody, if I have a, a treatment that might harm them, that there's a good chance of harming them, I'm not going to give the treatment. But if it might have no effect, and it might have an effect, like we're always uncertain and there's always different people, different effects in different people. So there's heterogeneity of effect. So if something might help some people and at the worst does nothing, then I might personally take the treatment if it's cheap, right? Uh, but if it's harmful, then uh, I probably wouldn't do it. So um, even as a personal thing, I, yeah. that's the way I would react, so. Thank you. And Wonking has a, a, a question. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Abbott. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Ian, for that very interesting introductory talk. 
I uh, just have a quick question. My background from AI background and the, with the previous slide you mentioned, uh, uh, if we apply AI, we find that the, uh, the strength, the flexibility is not this correct, uh, the, uh, impact the injury, the chance of injury. Uh, if uh, from my perspective, would that be because it's not so much of AI and the causal inference, is it because of those variables, they are not at the same level? So some of the variable is built upon another variable, for instance, load is built upon another variable called flexibility or strength. So we mix different type of factors, it's a different objection level the factor together. That leads to the problem or is it because the approach we're taking the issues? Because okay, I see so from the diagram, previous diagram, uh, the load may not necessarily the primary variables here. Maybe the flexibility is the primary variables and the load is something, the interim variable between the strength and the injury, huh? Yeah, so, so yeah. yeah. So, let, let, so let me try and answer that. Um, first of all, absolutely they're different levels and it's not a problem of AI, it's a problem of all of epidemiology and all of science, mm -hmm. not understanding what these estimators do like what, how to inter properly interpret them. Mm. So AI follows the traditional, you're going to see in the next section that AI follows the traditional rules of epidemiology. The problem is that the traditional rules of epidemi epidemiology have omitted one very important fact, mm. and that's what leads to the problems. Now, this problem that I talked about is highlighted in a paper by Daniel Westrick in American Journal of Epidemiology and Sander Greenland, Westrick and Greenland, called the Table 2 Fallacy. Mm. And what it is, is it's just, it's not understanding how to interpret multiple regression models properly. It's not a problem of AI so much. I just wanted to say that if you do AI, this, and this is the true data generating process, you would end up with only sport load and load tolerance as important everything else would be unimportant. Mm -hmm. okay, I can simulate this data and that's what you would find. So, cause I, I there's no interact, I didn't put any interactions in here so I can get rid of that. And it's strictly, everything's working through those three, three, through those three variables in the toy example I created. Okay, so that's table two fallacy. It's a great paper for those of you who are thinking and people running multiple regression. I mean, I've given this talk, I have colleagues that I collaborate with. There's a paper now that I have refused to put my name on because they didn't understand this and they wrote a bunch of stuff. And I said, look, you're gonna get this published and everybody's gonna read it, but I can't have my name on it because my colleagues are gonna go, Ian, why did you publish a table two fallacy paper? Like, why did you have this problem in it? And I wouldn't be able to defend the paper. Um, so, but that's that's for me. Thank you. Right. Thank you, man. Does that help? Any other questions come up? Usually when one person asks a question, all of a sudden everybody becomes less shy. So um, if I do say anything here, please, please send the chat or even just start talking and interrupt me. I'm used to interactive talks and the video conferences are harder because I can't actually see people. Yeah, I'm monitoring the, the, the chat and seeing if anyone has... It's easier for me to see if you guys put any reaction, like a hand up or whatever. Uh, yeah. Then, but yeah, right. and the chat is also good. Okay, so let's go on, and we're going to talk about the difference between identifiability and estimation. And this is a big thing that most people don't realize. Um, and really, we're going to tra talk about identifiability, and it's something for me that I only, I, I've always had a huge problem with it until recently. Somebody told me something, and it's that. And ident a causal identifiability for a causal effect means that there is one and only one possible answer from the observed data to predict the outcome. So what does that mean? If I ask you the square root, if I ask you what's the square of, uh, what's two squared? There's only one answer, it's four, and that's identifiable. But if I ask you what the square root of four is, it's not because it could be two squared or negative two squared. And there is no way for you to determine which of those two answers is correct. 
So that's not identifiable. And when we have confounders that aren't measured or not properly adjusted, then we have two possible ways of generating the data, uh, of generating those data, and we don't know which one of those is correct, and therefore we don't know the true data generating process, which means we can't actually identify the causal effect. Once we determine that an effect is identifiable, it may or may not be easy to estimate. So some, and this is I get this is where I get trouble because when a causal effect is identifiable, I thought it means that there's always an estimator there that I can estimate it, and apparently that's not true. But that I'll leave for Roberto because I'm not a statistician, so maybe he can answer that later. Okay, standard confounder. If you look in any textbooks. It'll say it's associated with the exposure, associated with the outcome independent of exposure, and is not affected by exposure, in particular does not lie along the hypothesized causal path. And so if we're gonna draw it, we can say osteoarthritis affects how much activity you're gonna do because you have pain. And osteoarthritis is associated with a gait disorder, it'll make you limp. And limping will also change your activity patterns. But if you actually think about this and you look through the books more, you'll see a couple of other requirements for confounders. It can't be a marker for a variable that lies along the causal path. It can't be caused by the outcome and it must cause disease in the unexposed group and yield the true risk in exposed and unexposed. We don't have time to go through all of these. I wanna focus on those three. It's not affected by exposure, in particular does not lie along the causal path is not a marker for a variable on the causal path and will not be caused by the outcome. And these are all standard. So when we look at this and we say this covariate is associated with exposure and associated with the outcome, what does that mean? Because we have these rules. So let's just think about that. If, if the covariate is not caused by the outcome, what are the actual logical possibilities. There's only two. One is that the covariate causes the outcome. That's possible possibility one. Or that there is some other cause of the outcome and the covariate is a marker for that outcome, for that unmeasured cause. Notice here I have a double arrow. It doesn't matter if the covariate causes you or you causes the covariate. So that part doesn't matter, but it is important that you causes the outcome and that not that the outcome causes you. So these are our two choices. If it is the covariate is not caused by the outcome, then it must cause, and it's associated with the outcome, it must cause the outcome independently or be a marker for an independent cause of the outcome. If you can think of another logical option, that would be great but nobody has to date. Also, the covariate cannot be affected by exposure. Okay, what does that mean? And it must not be a marker for a variable affected by exposure. The only options are the covariate is a cause of the exposure or a marker for a cause of the exposure. Again, notice that when I said this, I had to use the word cause. And these, this necessity to use the word cause comes from traditional epidemiology. So when traditional epidemiology says, oh, you can't say anything about cause and effect, you can only talk about associations, it's internally inconsistent. There's no internal logic that can hold you to that because the statements themselves require that you understand the causal relationship between variables in order to say, I'm going to adjust for this variable or not. Now, when we draw causal diagrams, we don't draw them like this because they take too much space. So C is gonna be our covariate. And here we have C causing exposure, C causing exposure, C causing outcome, C causing outcome, exposure causing outcome, exposure causing outcome. This is just a more condensed way of looking at the data. We call it a directed acyclic graph or a cause, it's one type of causal diagram. It's not the only type. And it's called a causal DAG because all of these arrows are, they're directed. They have a base, 
and an N. There's no double arrows. And there's no arrow that goes from one variable to another and then back to the first. That would be a cycle. Uh, there are causal loops, but they are very different than causal directed acyclic graphs. And what you can get from them is very different. So each of these different types of causal graphs serves very specific purposes. So here's our um, question. And would you adjust for this covariate if this is the true data generating process? And DAGs are always about the true data generating process, not the variables that you measure. So if there are unmeasured variables that are part of the true data generating process, you have to include them in your DAG. Otherwise, you could only measure the exposure and the outcome, and no matter what you were doing, you would be able to identify the effect. So it's always about the true data generating process. So uh, I don't have the ability to do a poll, but I'm hoping that all of you would say, yes, you should adjust because the covariate is a cause of the outcome. Here are our two sentences. That's all you have to think about. Covariate is a cause of the outcome and a cause of the exposure. Satisfies these two sentences, satisfies the traditional requirements for a confounder in traditional epidemiology. And we'd say yes. Now, if we look at this one, normally I let you sit for 30 seconds and think about it. But if we think about this one, what we have here is C a cause of the outcome. No, there is no arrow from C to the outcome. So that is not true. Is it a marker for a cause of the outcome? Well, let's look at the other causes. U is a cause of the outcome. C is associated with U. Now, I told you, it doesn't matter what direction this arrow is in. If the arrow was in the other direction, then C would be a cause of the outcome. It would cause U, which would cause the outcome. But if U causes C, that's OK. Imagine this is one-to-one. -one. Every time U occurs, C occurs then whether you put C or U mathematically in the equation, you have the exact same numbers and it has to be true. To the extent that C is an imperfect measure of U, you may or may not reduce all of the confounding. But this is the idea that C is going to minimize the confounding of U. And so we can get, so the causal effect is identifiable because in the second one, C causes the exposure. So the second sentence is true. So we go, yes. Now here we have a slightly different one. Does C cause the outcome? Yes. Does C cause the exposure? No. But U is a cause of the exposure, and C is a marker of U. So it satisfies the two, and we're OK. What about this one? It's not. Now, why is it not? Because C is caused by the exposure. So remember, we're not supposed to put in any, if we want to know the total effect of exposure on outcome, we cannot put in any variables that are caused by exposure. Now, in the machine learning, this isn't a problem with machine learning, but it's a problem with some of the people who use machine learning, is that they forget that they're trying to create, even as prediction, and they include variables that are not present at the time that you have to make a decision. So there's a lot of stuff on um, radiology and imaging and whether you know MRIs can predict how long someone will get better. But what they do is they take the MRI and then they take information that is gained after the MRI is done. Sort of like, how, how do you have pain with like a week after you started treatment? Well, but the MRI was done before treatment. And so if you throw in that other information, the MRI is not predicting anything there because you've got other information that's helping you predict. And the MRI is, is just not important. Um, it's, it's just not gonna be a very good predictor. And so we have to be very careful when we include covariates that occur after exposure to make sure they're not affected by exposure. This is a very important one. Uh, and in this case, it's not, I thought I, oops, I thought I had my two sentences popping up, but uh, they're not coming up here. So here, the covariate is not a cause of the outcome, but it is a marker 
for a cause of the outcome. U is a cause of the outcome. But it is not a cause of the exposure and it's not a marker for the cause of exposure. And therefore, if you adjust for C, you're actually going to introduce bias. And this is a very famous paper that got me into causal inference by Clarice Weinberg from 1993 on spontaneous abortion. And the problem here is that although you're not conditioning on a thing that's along the causal path, you're conditioning on a marker for a variable that's along the causal path. And you might say, oh, who would ever do that? Well, people do it all the time when they're looking at types of competing events. So this is a type of competing event thing. Think if I'm interested in warm-up exercises and ankle sprains, but someone sprains their knee before they get an ankle sprain. What are you going to do with that person who sprained their knee? And if you're doing a survival analysis, you might say, well, I'm just gonna censor them at the time that they sprained their knee because I've got follow-up data. But if you do that, you're gonna get a biased answer. And you're gonna get a biased answer because you are conditioning, censoring, conditioning, on something that is a marker for something lying along the causal pathway. It's called, in, in epidemiology, sometimes it's called informative censoring. And in AI, if you're not careful in machine learning, you're gonna end up with the same problem. Again, if you do it properly, you won't, but that's a whole other issue. Now, what about this one? Here we have, C is not a cause of the outcome, but it is a marker for you, which is a cause of the outcome. It's not a cause of the exposure, and it's not a marker for a cause of the exposure. So that is a problem that you don't want to adjust for this. Now, I like beating a dead horse. So here's the other example we had on the previous slide. And in that one, it's exactly the same except for this direction of this one arrow. So using traditional epidemiology, what we say is that, oh, don't have to think about causes, just association. But now I just show you in these two, here you want to adjust for the covariate and here you do not. And the only difference is the direction of that arrow. So if you are using double arrows to say that things are just associated and you think you can decide on model on the appropriate covariate selection for model selection, Think of this example, because this just tells you, you cannot, you must have an underlying hypothesis about this. Now, if you're not sure what the direction of that arrow is, then you're not sure what the correct statistical model is. And if your two statistical models give you different answers, you don't know which of them is correct. If they give you the same answer, then you could say, well, it doesn't matter because either way I'm getting the same, I'm getting the same answer. So I can ignore it. Now here's what we call uh, an M structure. And the question is, do we adjust for this? So we have, oops. we have that the covariate doesn't cause the outcome, but it's a marker for U2, which is a cause of the outcome. And the covariate doesn't cause the exposure, but it's a marker for U1, which is a cause of exposure. So by traditional epidemiological principles, this is a confounder and you should adjust for it in order to get an unbiased result. And this is what AI and machine learning does as well. And this is the problem that it ignores. Because if you adjust for this, this is called a collider because we have two arrows colliding on it. And that introduces bias. How does that introduce bias? This is a, a graph from Pearl's book in, in, in the last chapter's um, epilogue uh, where he describes this and we described how this works in a paper in 2008. Think about the season and in the springs, you have automatic sprinklers and it rains. Both of those cause the field to get wet and the field is slippery and you could fall and hurt yourself. Now, if I tell you that the field is wet, then that means sprinklers and rain are associated in at least one level. What does that mean? Well, if it's wet 
and I told you it did not rain. I hope all of you would say the sprinklers are almost for sure on. I mean, it is possible that someone came and peed all over the lawn or some dog peed over the lawn and made it wet. So there might be other causes of wet. But clearly, if it didn't rain and the field is wet, it is very likely the sprinkler is on. And that's the definition of an association. Having knowledge about one variable, rain, gives you information about the other one. Sprinkler. Now notice, if I told you that the field was wet and it rained, you don't know if the sprinklers were on or not because it's an automatic sprinkler. So it's only it only has to be within one level for that association to occur and for it to screw up your results. For those of you who like math, we could think of, X, this is just a simple example, x4 is equal to x2 plus x3. If x4 is 10 and I tell you x2 is 7, I hope most of you will tell me that x3 is 3. That's all it is. So when we have this collider, we create an association between u1 and u2. Now we have information traveling non-causally from exposure to u1 to u2 and down to outcome, and that's bias. In the causal inference literature, we call that collider stratification bias. Some people will call it induced confounding bias because the confounding only occurs if you include C. So if you ran your model, just exposure to outcome with no covariates, you get the right answer. If you include the covariate, you get the wrong answer. So introducing additional covariates does not only increase your variance. For those of you who are used to AI, thinking, oh, maybe I'll get more variance, but I'm going to reduce my bias. That's not true. It's not just a bias variance trade-off. Here, you're going to increase your variance and increase your bias. Now, collider stratification bias is well known. Uh, it's, it's the reason underlying what we call Bergson's bias. For those of you who know it, if we do a case control study and we use everybody from the emergency room and we're interested in whether estrogen uh, prevents heart attacks, uh, in actual fact, estrogen will look, if this is true, which it is, if we do this case control study, estrogen will look like it protects against heart attacks. Why? Because in order to be at the eMERGE, you have to have some reason for going to the emergency room. People with fractures go to the emergency room. People with heart attacks go to the emergency room. Estrogens prevent fractures. Therefore, if estrogens prevent fractures, but fractures are associated with infarctions, uh, uh, inversely associated with heart attacks for eMERGE, then that's what's going to be. Now, you go, what do you mean associated? Well, look, if you go to the eMERGE and I, and I know you don't have a heart attack, then chances are you have a fracture, if those were the only two causes of being at eMERGE. Now, of course, there's other causes too. So not being at the eMERGE without a heart attack means you have a very high chance of having some other cause of being at the eMERGE. I mean, you have to. So that's where the inverse association occurs. And so that's going to travel through when we look at estrogen. Estrogen prevents fracture, which means it has an inverse association with myocardial infarction. It also affects with uh, attrition bias when people drop out. If the treatment and the disease both cause the same side effects and that causes you to drop out, then when you exclude dropouts, which you might have to do because you don't have data on them, you create this association with treatment and mild disease and death. Now it goes on further to think about obesity and um, I don't have that much time. I want to spend the last 10 minutes for something. So I'll, I'll run through this quick. Obesity causes heart failure. Heart failure causes death. And obesity causes death independent of heart failure. The thing is that the risk of death in obese patients with heart failure is less than the risk of death in non-obese patients with heart failure. So... The reason, and people have written books on this, and there's like, uh, I don't know, 100 meta-analysis claiming that obesity might be preventive, might be good for you if you have heart failure. And it's taken about 10 years for us to convince those people that they're wrong. And part of the reason we could convince them is because randomized trials came out showing that they're wrong. But the idea is 
that amongst heart failure patients, yes, those who are obese do better than non-obese, but that's because obesity causes a very mild form of heart failure. Another reason for heart failure is that you've actually killed half your heart because it doesn't have enough blood supply or that you have myocarditis and the virus has killed you know, parts of your heart. So the heart just can't pump, which is much more severe than obesity. So when we say there's obese heart failure and non-obese heart failure, they are very different diseases, but we don't have the same name. So now I'm gonna go and think about diabetes. We have obesity causes diabetes type two and islet cell failure in her pancreas causes diabetes type one. So this is the type that requires insulin. And, but we don't call both of those, we say diabetes, but we know these are different diseases, completely different. And heart failure, we could think of the same thing. Obesity causing a mild form of heart failure and other causes causing severe form of heart failure and we're just causing them as heart failure. And if we condition just on diabetes without understanding that these are different, then we create these negative associations and obesity will appear protective. And in fact, my colleagues, Steve Stovitz and, uh, and Haley Bannock and Jay Kaufman did exactly that in, a, in one paper and showed how obesity is, would, if you did observational studies, would appear preventive for diabetes instead of causative, if you're looking at kids where mostly it's juvenile obesity. Okay, we don't have time to go through all of this, which is too bad because I talked too much and went off on tangents. Um, so hold on, let's go through this. I want to go to Daggety. You guys can still see my screen? All good, all good. And let's go hide it. The next one is not detail. private. Yeah. Okay, so this is the site that you would come to, and we're just going to launch, launch Daggety. Now, what we've done, what he's done here is he's just created a nice interface to draw up these particular things. Now, I'm going to go to an example. This is the example that Robert Platt and I did in our paper, which is really just the actual same diagram that Pearl did in the appendix of his book, and I just put word, made up words to it. This is where we have this green with an arrow. That's our exposure of interest, which is warm-up exercises. Injury with the eye is our outcome of interest. And then we have all these other variables. Now, assuming that you, I'll show you how to draw this as well, but I want to show you up here. This is the adjustment for, can you guys see that well, Alberto, or should I make it larger? That, that's good to me. Okay, I made it a little larger for you guys. Okay, so here we have adjustment of total effect. And what this is saying is if I want to know the total effect of warm up on exercises, I, can I should include only coach and fitness level. That's all I have to do. Coach and fitness level. Whoops. I shouldn't have done that. That's how, that's how you create an arrow is just clicking. But if I include coach and fitness level, I will get an unbiased estimate. You put in machine learning, you might end up with a whole bunch of these things, but really all I need is coach and fitness level. Or I could coach and pregame proprioception. Or I could do fitness level and team motivation or any one of these things. And so I end up with a bunch of different sets. Now, obviously, the, regarding which ones I should use, well, some of these measures might be very expensive. So I'm designing the study. I'm going to design it, and I'm going to make sure I measure at least one of these sets so I could get an unbiased estimate. But measuring neuromuscular fatigue is actually quite intensive and requires a lot of equipment and is expensive. So if I can get away with getting an unbiased effect without having to measure it, then that would be great. If I did measure all of these things and threw them all in, AI would come up with a predictive measure, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's causal. For instance, previous injury is known to be the most important risk factor for future injury, but it's a predictive, not necessarily causal. I'm not gonna say it's not causal, but in this, I don't have previous injury causing future injury. But watch what happens here. I'm just going to take previous injury. And I, all I do here is I press A for adjustment. 
And that forces previous injury into the model. So here you now see previous injury is in each of these models. Okay. So if I, and then if I take A, it removes it. So that's how I can force variables in the model. And now I have to be more careful because when I didn't include it, I could do coach and fitness level and I'd be fine. But when I include it, I now have coach fitness level and not only previous injury, but now I have to include contact sports as well. And all of these are proven through theorems. So this is going to give you the right answer. And if you really like, you can, and you want to do direct effects and indirect effects, and those who know about instrumental variables, you can do instrumental variables as well. So now if I go back and I'm going to create a new variable, let's, all I have to do is double click anywhere. And I get a new variable called variable one. Here it is. If I want to join this variable one to another variable, I click on variable one and I click on fitness. And if I want to get rid of it, I click on variable one and I click on fitness again. And if I want to make this a cause of the injury, I could do that. And notice this is blue. And so we've got this blue is an ancestor of the outcome. But if I also make it an ancestor of warm-up exercises, now it turns red because it's an ancestor of both exposure and outcome. And that's what it can, and that would be something that you would have to block as a confounding pathway. So we do that. If I want to rename this, I just hold my cursor over, I hit R, and I can call it rename. Of course, I have to be able to spell right. But if I want to delete it, I just hold it over and I hit D and it goes away. It's that easy. Sometimes these things get crowded and you can even do this. Whoops. You can go over the arrow and make it into a curve. So if you like that curve. So I think I'm, I got two minutes. Um, and you can go through in this. There's obviously lots of other examples of how you could do it. You can set more than one exposure. So now I have this would be as if I wanted to intervene on both of these simultaneously as a combined exposure. You could do that and get the minimum social minimum sufficient adjustment set for estimating the total effect of both TT and U. So you're going to change both of them at the same time or neither at the same time. And that would be the total causal effect for that. There's a lot more in this program. The help is pretty good. There's moral graphs where we take out arrows. There's correlations, equivalents. There's a lot of different, uh, those of you who do, do structural equation modeling, this is what that would look like. Um, and in, in fact, if we went, uh, I'm not back at the beginning, but in, in the actual first thing, um, there's some other new fancier things that he's put in that are still being developed. So that's Daggety. And so as much as you are thinking just in a traditional sense, we can go back to the normal, go back to a, this graph. If you were able, oops, classic. If I was able to look at this and I said, shit, this is what I think the data generating process is, but I don't know how to read all of these things and tell me what is, uh, tell me which variables I should adjust for. I can just go and look it up over here. And that's what makes Daggety very nice. Now you still have to be able to draw this causal DAG. And apparently I don't teach large groups, but people who do say that there's about 50% of the people who actually have trouble just drawing these graphs. Their mind doesn't work in that type of causal way. And they just get very confused very quickly about where they can put arrows and where they can't, where you remove arrows. Um, I've, I've tried to give you a very broad overview. Uh, Don Rubin is one of the statisticians. He wrote a paper once who said, I'm going to simplify things in this paper. For those of you who know more, please don't write nasty letters. I know that I'm simplifying it, but it's only so that I can, you know, uh, uh, teach it properly. Uh, my analogy is when I learned what square roots of numbers, we didn't learn that there is a square root of a negative number. We were told that that's not possible. That was a simplification. And obviously there are square roots of negative numbers, um, but you have to learn that at a later date. So it's one step at a time. And this is uh, where I think we would be at the end of this step.